Okay, hey everybody. So, I'm Catherine Mitchell. I'm currently a research scientist at Bigelow, which is just across the river. Um, and I, so I did my undergraduate degree in, I'm from Scotland. My accent doesn't give it away. I did my undergraduate degree in physics and maths. And um, towards the end of that, I wanted to move into something a bit more applied. And I found this PhD program. Um, still in Glasgow, that was about looking at um, ocean colour patterns in the Irish Sea, so off the coast of mainland UK. And I was like, oh, that sounds a bit different. And it was very much about how light interacts with the materials in the water and causing the, the colour changes that we see from satellite. And, and during my PhD, I didn't um, really look too much into the biology. I was very much focused on trying to separate the light signal that was being driven by the sediments in the Irish Sea and that which was being driven by the phytoplankton. Because it's a big problem there for the standard um, NASA chlorophyll algorithms get very confused about the sediments in that region. And so we're trying to come up with an approach to separate that so that we can then do the biology or do the sediment work. Um, and so that was kind of what I did my PhD in. And towards the end of my PhD, I was like, OK, I don't know what I want to do now or where I want to go. I always said I never want to live in America. And then I saw this great postdoc that was advertised and he, uh, here in Maine. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll apply for it, like see what happens. And then next thing you know, I'm frantically writing my thesis, doing my viva, moving to Maine. And so that was in March 2015. So I've been here for just over four years. Did a postdoc there for four years working with Barney Balch, who does a lot of, most of his research is are focused around coccolithophores, so a sp particular type of phytoplankton that scatter a lot. Um, and he looks at that from a lot of different angles. And I came in to kind of do the optics side of that and look at remote sensing algorithms for that and then kind of worked on this stuff on the side and I'll get into a bit more detail um, detail about that. And so that's kind of where I've been and what I've been doing and towards the end of my postdoc, uh, my husband is here with me and we're like, we love living in Maine, can we stay living in Maine for longer? And so I recently started this position, more permanent position at Bigelow. And so I think Bigelow, I don't know if you know this, is a soft money institute. So that means I have to write grants to get the money to pay my salary, which has some, some challenges, but it has some, some benefits too. Um, and my position is a bit transitional, and so Big O are going to help support me a bit in the first few years with the hope that I'm super successful. So we'll see how that goes. So that's why I've kind of got here um, and where I am now. And I wanted to talk to you about this because I, it's kind of a bit more of an applied version of some of the stuff that you'll have been covering in class. And it covers a lot of different aspects. Um, working with different instruments or working with instruments and working with field data and having to process that. There's a little bit of modeling in here and there's quite a bit of radiative transfer theory and optical inversion stuff. Um, and so I, I actually never did this course, so I don't know exactly what you've been taught. And so some of this might be a bit repetitive for some of the things that you've been learning. Um, or if I'm assuming something that you don't know, just stop me, ask what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. And so really what I've been working with are um, slocum gliders. And so I... Have they, has anybody been working with these or do you know a lot about them? So you do, great. Um, so this is a slocum, this is one of our gliders. What's missing are its wings. It does have two wings. Um, this was him ready to go out for, to be deployed in the Gulf of Maine. This one's called Grampus, which is named after uh, Henry Bigelow, who was a scientist in the area and did a lot of work in the Gulf of Maine at the, in the early 1900s. And this was the name of the schooner that he used. And our other glider is called Henry, after Henry Bigelow. And here's kind of a schematic, and this is just for your interest, because um, I'll share my slides with you afterwards. Um, I'm not kind of going to go into the details. I'm just going to run this. It's just going to run video with the volumes on. Turn this down. Um, of 
the glider um, diving. And so what, how these gliders work are, it's basically all about buoyancy and the hydrodynamics. And so what the gliders don't have is any kind of propeller. Um, how they work is they have this inflatable bladder uh, kind of in the tail fin area. And actually, if you keep looking, look underneath, you'll see some blue lights flashing at some point, and I'll come back to that. Um, and so the, this bladder inflates and deflates and pulls in water and uh, pushes out water to change the, the volume, basically, of the glider and change its buoyancy. And with the, the shape of the wings, and the shape of the whole glider, that's enough to give it motion to move up and down and to move forward. And they swim along in these kind of um, yos, these kind of diagonal um, profiles up and down through the water column. And they just have a small rudder in the tail to kind of change the, the direction that they're going on. And so those blue flashing lights you saw, uh, did, I don't know if you saw them, um, but they were from uh, Wet Labs EcoPack, so they're the backscattering um, sensor that's on it. And so you can put uh, a bunch of different um, sensors on the gliders just now. What we have on our gliders are they all come equipped with the CTD. And we have um, radiometers, we have an LU sensor and, and an ED sensor, so downwelling irradiance and upwelling radiance sensors. And we have the Wet Labs EcoPuck, so we're measuring backscattering at 532 nanometers, the chlorophyll fluorescence in the CDOM fluorescence. And Grampus actually also has um, on him an oxygen sensor and a nitrate sensor was very recently installed. And the wavelengths of our radiometry sensors are a bit different on the gliders. Um, these are all what's on Henry and Grampus only has four of those, which I can't remember off the top of my head of what those are. And so the question really is why do we want to use gliders to, to look at the ocean and to do any and to do optics? And do you do you guys have any kind of idea of what benefit you might have from using this kind of instrument that is swimming up and down through the water column? Sorry? Uh, yeah, that's true, and that's very great. <laughs> Anything else? Vertical structure. Yes, so the vertical structure is very useful. And so typically, if you think about the other platforms that we use, and it was actually nice to come into the end of that session you were talking about, but satellites, and typically the current satellites are seeing this upper surface layer. Um, and ships, you can get a profile of the vertical structure, but it's only typically in one place, and it's like the snapshot. Um, but with gliders, you can kind of send them out on these missions and get a much wider area over a much kind of higher time scale. Um, and the interesting thing is something that I've been thinking about, which is why it was f fun to see the end of the last lecture and you talking about LIDAR, is there are then taking these measurements through the water column and our potential tool for using to kind of validate some of the LIDAR studies that are being trying to be done about ocean colour and the phytoplankton biomass and structure in the water column. And to give you an idea of the kind of detail that we can see from using, using a glider, this is just one of the transects we've taken. Uh, of, this is chlorophyll fluorescence. Um, Starting on the left hand side is this side of the Gulf of Maine and the far side is swimming across to Canada. And you can see you can kind of get this very detailed high resolution structure um, that we are not able to get from satellite and we're not able to get from ships. And the other major benefit of the gliders is we can send them out whenever we want and we don't have to be out there on a boat sampling. So we can just let them go and do their thing and stay in the lab and control them from there, which is really great. Uh, how long does it take to do the transaction? It takes, uh, the whole mission is about b the battery life dependent. So they run on batteries. It's about 23 to 25 days to go there and back. To go there and back. Yeah. And so the question really is like, why are we wanting to do this? So 
kind of spoken a little bit about the reason for using gliders is they only really see the surface layer and we can really increase our temporal coverage without having to pay the expense of, of a ship time. But our interest in it was really as well about using the optics and the optical proxies we can get from the sensors to kind of understand and characterise the, the given system. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're doing this and how like a typical glider mission is run and the kind of things we have to think about. And so I'll start with this nice image of where we are. Star is right where we are. And this line is the um, Gulf of Maine <coughs> North Atlantic time series, which Barney, my um, old boss, has been running for the last 20 years within the Gulf of Maine. It's been running along this line. And it was actually, there's some more historic measurements that were started before him. So Henry Bigelow was doing some measurements in the Gulf of Maine back in the early 1900s. But also Charlie Yench, who was the founder of Bigelow Lab, was doing... Uh, kind of started some of these time series measurements, but Barney kind of has made it a lot more regular. And this um, time series was started really for satellite ocean color validation. And we use an underweight optical system. Um, we have a van that is equipped out with a bunch of different optical instruments and stations for doing some filtering and taking some chlorophyll samples. And we have a full, uh, a full cam we run to image the types of phytoplankton we're seeing. But it all works by, it's an old shipping container with all this stuff in it. We drive it onto the passenger ferry that runs between Portland and Yarmouth in Nova Scotia. And we just plug into the, under the, the water line and run that through all the instruments that are in the van. But what that means is we're just sampling this surface layer the whole time. With the NATS program, we're never me measuring anything that's going on at depth. And, well, that's not true, I guess. We, we fire uh, temperature profiles off. Um, so we do have temperature at depth, but that's the only um, measurement they're making, that we're making that is done at depth. And so there was interest in getting some information about the vertical structure, which is why the gliders were added to this program. They were, they've been running for about 10 years along this. And so the whole time series really is about 20 years. Um, and yes, yeah, so we have these two different gliders. And if we run this video, and so this is just how we typically deploy the glider over the we over the side of a lobster boat we use a local lobsterman as our, our our research vessel and it's a bit of a challenge um trying to manhandle this thing over the side of the boat and the ctd is kind of round on the the side of the shaft and so sometimes it kind of gets in the way and you don't want to break it but every time we deploy the glider we take some water samples uh, that we use and the same when we recover the glider at the end of a mission for calibration of the fluorometers and the backscattering sensors that are that are on um, the gliders um, and once he is gracefully in the water we have him tied to a small um, buoy and we do we have to run some tests before we set them on the way so the nice thing, so the thing with the gliders is we control them fully from the lab when they're going compared to Argo floats, they get put out and they're left there and they do their thing. Um, we have full control over the gliders. I think that's it finished, I'll just loop it on again. Can I make it clean? Um, we have full control and so we set some waypoints for the gliders across the Gulf of Maine and say swim to here, swim to here, swim to here. They come up to the surface every six hours, they get a GPS fix, see where they are, correct their direction to get back on track, dive down again and swim, um, kind of turning beneath the surface and only coming up again six hours later. So they tend to swim in this kind of like zigzag across the centre of the Gulf of Maine. Um, and so yes, they are running on battery life. And so the whole time we get them to every six hours send back their battery curve so we can see how much power there is in them. 
and we've been doing it for so long we know okay this is the point we really need to turn the glider around and send him back sometimes they make it further and um, depending on the way the tides are going or the way the currents are moving uh, sometimes they go very fast sometimes they don't sometimes they don't go where you want them to go and it's a bit a uh, bit of a nightmare really and while the gliders are out for the 20-25 days the two technicians in our lab are, are kind of driven up the wall because they're checking their emails every six hours and um, because the glider will email us and say here I am this is what I'm doing um, and you know we just we just check that everything is going okay Were those the radiance sensors on top? So, yeah so on top is the radiance sensor um, and uh, there's one on the bottom as well. And so you see that the angle that they're at, that's really important because they swim up at this, in, in this kind of um, pitch, and, but you want your, your sensors to be flat. And so that's why they kind of have this angle so that they're swimming up like that. And we actually get from the gliders their pitch data and their roll data so we can remove any data that we think is not good because the sensors were orientated in the, in the wrong way. And that's part of part of the cleaning that we do. And so then this is the recovery, which is also very challenging, almost more challenging in some respects. Uh, so the glider at the end of the mission will come up. He'll ping us, say where he is, and we're out on a boat trying to find him. And we have a rough GPS coordinate of where he is. Bruce is sitting in the lab, emailing us, like, this is where he's supposed to be. And we're all scanning around, just looking for the little yellow tail fin sticking out of the water. Sometimes it's very easy, sometimes it's not, especially when you're in rolling seas. And then we go, and then we have to try and manhandle him back onto the cart and kind of pull him up, uh, up and out of the water. And so it's try and get the nose into that cone at the end. And that's kind of really helpful for that. And so once we get the glider back, the challenge is then what do we do with all these data? So there are a bunch of different instruments on there, as I've been saying, and all these different instruments are measuring at slightly different sample rates. And um, so you have kind of a series of data that don't quite match each other in depth or in time. And so we have to bend that. And typically, we bend the data into one meter depth intervals. And and kind of match up all these different uh, measurements from the different instruments. And then before we do anything with any of the radiometry data, it's important to kind of do some quality control of those profiles. And the big thing that we're concerned about um, for the work that I've been doing is we are trying to look at variations in the light field that are being driven by the stuff that's in the water. But if the sky conditions are changing, you'll also get some of these variations that are visible in the light field. And we want to remove that effect so we're left with just the biology or, or what's going on in the water column. And so that really is just the information I think that I've been talking about. Yeah, didn't see anything else there. And so what we do to kind of quality control the, um, the glider, glider profiles is first of all we remove um, downwelling irradiance and upwelling radiance values that are that are very quite that are that are pretty low and they're kind of our dark values and we're removing any data that are sh that are shallower than 10 meters uh, to minimize some of the surface effects that we see um, from focusing of light rays through the, the water surface. And there's actually not too many data within that region because the gliders come up and then they usually turn without coming all the way to the surface. Depending on the glider, the depth where they start that turn is, is slightly different. And so we only have data in that upper, upper layer when they're coming right up to the surface every six hours. And so then if we have measurements, profiles that are left that still have 10 measurement depths, um, after that, we kind of keep those um, profiles as good quality, like there's enough kind of data there to at least start doing something with it. And then we want to kind of begin to look at some of these weird artifacts that might be happening because of different things. And for this, so the Argo float, bio Argo float community have had radiometers on, on their floats for a while and there's some well-developed 
protocols for dealing with the radiometers and how to process those data. And so all we do with the glider data is follow those same protocols, really. And that's based on um, Organelli et al. And I'm going to kind of talk a bit more about those details on the next couple slides. But an extra feature that we've added into this is um, to remove any effects due to clouds. And this is kind of very wordy, but it makes more sense if we kind of look at a profile. So if you, if you imagine this is the kind of profile that I'm getting from the glider data. Is this the kind of thing that you might expect to see from what you've been learning about your downwelling irradiance profiles? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we're plotting log against log ED against depth, and we expect that to be more of a straight line than, than this is. And so these kind of artifacts we think are caused by a cloud passing over as the profile comes along. So what we want to do is make sure that the, the data that we're using are all monotonically decreasing so that we end up with the straight line. And so here, if we look at this, basically if we remove these three points, then our ED values are still kind of increasing as you go, or decreasing, I guess, as you go down from depth. So we just get rid of those, right? And then we kind of fit the profiles with polynomials and remove some of the outliers based on the residuals from that. And the final um, fitted poly polynomial is what we, we use as our quality controlled um, irradiance and radiance data. We do the same procedure for both um, LU and ED profiles. And so if we kind of go into what, um, how this classification works, and this figure is kind of taken out of the Organelli et al. paper. And so what they're doing is after the dark currents are, yes? Sorry, can we go back? Yep. Do you want? Uh, yeah, so I, I understand this is a cartoon, but why do you remove those three points instead of the flight of the Yeah, so the idea is that um, we think this decrease here, is there a pointing stick or anything? Um, yeah, so we think <laughs> this part is kind of fine. And we, but we think this, there's this kind of artifact of decrease here that is from a, from a cloud. And, um, yeah. Yeah, so. Why wouldn't you just shift it over? Good point. Um, but the, so I have kind of amplified the effect with my cartoon. So it's maybe slightly unrealistic of how big this, this effect is happening. Um, I never thought about shifting it over. So like what you get, so typically you get these, this and this part align a lot better with each other and you get more of a deviation off like this here and then it kind of jumps back to the straight line and um, so I guess my cartoon is is badly drawn it should be more like this right these points should be in more of a line together if that makes more sense <laughs> and so then the Yes, this classification that was developed by Organelli et al. What they do is they typically use fourth order polynomials to fit to their data. And they do a fit between the log ED and, and depth. And they look at the R squared value of that. And if it's below a given value, they flag this data as quality three, which is they're saying their the lowest quality data. And then they remove some of the residuals from that. Again, flagging those data that they remove as, um, as flag three. And we keep going. And if once the outliers have been removed, fit another polynomial to the data. Uh, so this is just a repeat polynomial fit box. And then again, look at the R squared of that profile. Again, if the R squared is still less than um, a given value. It's still flagged as not very good quality. But if the R squared is a bit better, then we again go through this, uh, this cycle of um, 
looking at some resid we're looking at the residuals and removing them, uh, removing any um, points that are outside of the standard deviation. Yes. Yeah, uh, so we only are taking the upcast actually. So yes, we only have sciences measuring on the upcast because of the orientation that the glider is in when it's going up is when it's important for um, measuring the data. Yes. Throughout the top 10 and we remove kind of the noise at the bottom. So it just depends how much uh, light there is, but typically within the top, like, I don't think we're ever going like less than 50 meters. The, w the log of the absolute. The so you're, are you are allowing for depth variability in the Allowing for depth variability, yes. Well, so this. So this is the procedure that has been done and developed by Organelli et al. Yeah. And we're just following that. And my uh, remembering from what I read in their paper and their analysis is they do fit a straight line and a few different orders of polynomial. And um, I can't remember now the exact reason that they ended up falling on the fourth order polynomial as kind of capturing um, the best, capturing like smoothing the profile in a, in a good way, but still not losing some of the depth variability, the depth variability of what's going on. Yeah, because that's, that's an important point. We don't want to remove things that are happening because of the biology just to get our nice straight, straight line. And so this is, as well as removing bad quality data, it's also a way to kind of smooth the data because we'll see as we get further into this method, what we end up doing is taking derivatives of our radiometry profiles. And once we start to do that, if you have kind of weird clunky profiles, you get very weird looking derivatives, which make life a lot harder when you're trying to do this kind of thing. And so the basic idea, yes, is to fit this, this fourth order polynomial through your data, look for any outliers, throw them out, and fit again and kind of go through that process a few times, getting higher and higher classifications on your R squared value for a better and better fit. And each time you're, you're kind of ending up with a higher quality profile. Um, and we get all this information about the different points and you can do this on a point, yes, okay. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can do this on a point by point basis um, so you can say like this point in my profile is not good quality or you can do it um, for the profile as a whole. Yes. So on, on um, the, these tests were designed for ED yes. for downloading on books. How do you do it for all your It's the same procedure just change for all your That's a good point. I do not do anything about shading for the glider. Um, or I haven't at this point. I have spoken to some people after I presented this at Ocean Optics about, about that fact. I know there's some people based at Villefranche that have kind of been looking at those, those problems of the shading from the glider. But yeah, that's not something that we've incorporated into this. And in terms of the LU, yes, we're using um, the same method for that. And yeah, because don't have anything else at the moment. And so this is just all this put into one big line. And typically, like, there's then these overall classifications that Organelli et al do that say the ones that were kind of in the earlier stages that had lots of bad things, we're, we're saying those whole profiles are probably your bad quality. And then in this intermediate zone where you've removed some data, but some of it like, is looking okay, these are kind of marginal, and then it's not till you get to the end of these like very high quality data that are left that um, are, are classified as good. Yes. Um, do you think most of the bad data comes from when it's like when it's wobbling? Partly from when it's wobbling, so they like they can roll and they can like pitch as well. So partly from that. Um, 
partly sometimes we don't really know like there might just be some weird schmutz that goes over the sensor for a while or there's a lot of fishing gear out there you know I don't know how close we get to that and um, if you get any weird effects from that and also just these weird varying sky effects and we're um, these varying varying light conditions from the sky rather than from the water okay sorry. yes sorry Yeah, and so there has been some discussion about that, but if you, as soon as you add something to the glider, you're really changing its hydrodynamics and it, its movement might not work the same. And also, can't actually see a lot with the cameras as soon as you're underwater with the, the GoPro type cameras. As you maybe saw from those um, deployment and recovery videos, as soon as you're underwater and you're right at the surface there, it's still quite hard to see like, what's going on. And so from a camera, I'm not sure we would actually get much Unless extra. Next to your sensor and then it's seeing exactly what your sensor is. Yeah, exactly. But then the concern we have is one, how do we attach it? And two, is that really going to change the flight of it? And is it within the, keeping it out of the, the field of view of the sensor is then a challenge as well. And you'll see further on, we have we see some differences between the two gliders and I and I kind of come back to to that field of view issue. Okay, so like we have our gliders, we put them out, we got them back, we did all this crazy kind of stuff to get our data into a farm that we would like to actually do some science with it. And like this was um, the the general direction of where we wanted to go with the science. It was to just kind of use the optics and the optical proxies to understand what's going on. And my interest as well was, can we increase the spectral information that we have? So we have these radiometer, radiometers on the gliders that are me measuring seven wavelengths on one and four on the other. Um, and can we try and get some more information about the IOPs um, from those, those radiometers? And this has been done um, before from remote sensing or from other um, platforms and the idea you know is you're starting with your radiance and you're starting with your downwelling irradiance and you're going to your absorption and you're going to your backscattering and as I'm sure you all are very aware now these are related through the radiative transfer equation and typically we can go in this forward direction if we know our absorption and our backscattering we can figure out what her, our radiance and irradiance should be. And this is some, and so like going in this backwards direction though, is more challenging, going from radiance and irradiance to absorption and backscattering. And this is what's known as the inversion problem, as I'm sure you've done in some of your remote sensing satellite classes since being here. And um, taking it from remote sensing though, and looking at it, through the water column, there's been, there's been, so, there are some studies out there that have done this, and this one in particular I'm highlighting because they use the same method that we, that we end up using on the gliders. And this study was based in the Ligurian Sea, and they measured some properties on the shelf, and they measured some properties off the shelf. Um, so in the Mediterranean between Italy and mainland here, uh, it's in this corner, and um, what they were using is they were profiling an AC9, I think, and a BB9 and profiling radiometers. And from those measurements, um, trying to uh, take the radiometry data and infer the, the IOPs. And the interesting point about this study is they weren't profiling all these instruments at the same time. So there's a bit of a time delay between when they profile their IOP sensors and when they profile their radiometry sensors. So you're not necessarily sampling the exact same water with these two kind of sets of equipment. And what they do is they, and I'm going to go into details of the inversion method, so we don't need to worry about that right now, but they take the radiometry data and from that they calculate their absorption, their scattering and their backscattering and compare that to what they measured in situ. Um, 
And here they've colored the different wavelengths um, on the different dots. And what, if we have a look, a bit of a look at this, what, what, what kind of jumps out at you about um, their results here? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. So there's this shift in the absorption, and that's their big result. And there's one kind of other kind of distinguishing feature, I would say, anyone, is this kind of shift here as well, out in the higher back scattering. And in their paper, do you, can you think of any reasons why you might have that shift in absorption? So remember what we're doing here is we're taking radiometers and we're calculating absorption from that and we're comparing it to in situ absorption that was measured by an EC9. So can you think of any problems that might come there? Sorry? Not, not path, well, it, no, not the path length, but um, have you spoken a bit about optical closure? Yes. So you want to know that your radiometers and your IOP sensors are agreeing in theory. And so what they, in this paper, attribute this difference to is um, because of, it's really this, per this part, an imperfect scattering correction. So they're saying that the absorption they're measuring, they think is not quite right because of this imperfect scattering correction. And so when they're comparing their result, um, that's what they're attributing this difference to. And the other thing that they comment on is the shape of the phase function. Um, so you have done some stuff about phase functions in class and how you might have phase functions that have the same backscattering to scattering ratio, but their shape might be a bit different. And so part of the inversion method, we're going to assume a particular phase function. And they're saying we think we did it wrong. Yes? But you haven't told us the equation that they're using, so it's really hard to, at this point, evaluate. Yes, we will come to that. Because if we don't know what equation, then we can't really say why they're overestimating A and underestimating B. Yeah, no, that's, that's a true point. Um, and we will come to that. We will... Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Like, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure I fully agree with these reasons for this, this method to, uh, in this situation. Um, I was just kind of putting this up here for now to kind of give a slight view of, um, these are other people that have been doing this in a particular way. And um, we will kind of come back and revisit, revisit this further on. And so the question really is, how are we going to do this inversion? How are we going to start with the radiometry data and go to our absorption and our backscattering? And the method we're going to follow is one that was published in this series of applied optics papers. And it basically works by starting with an estimate of the absorption profile using Gershon's law, which we will go into the details of in a minute. Um, and um, so using the radiometry data, making a best guess of absorption. And then from that, um, in using some other assumptions that exist, make a guess of our backscattering profile. And then with that and a couple other assumptions, we try and solve the radiative transfer equation. And then we compare the output um, from the radiative transfer equation, so the output uh, LU and ED that we get with what is being measured on the glider. And if they don't match that well, we iterate around and go back around this cycle, adjust our guess of absorption, adjust our guess of backscattering, solve the equation again. And once our output and our measured values are similar to each other and match to a level of confidence that we're happy with. We stop the, the process and say that the absorption and backscattering we used for that last calculation is our 
best guess of what the profiles are in the water column. Did you have a question? Uh, good point. Um, no, yes. Each each wavelength is solved independently, which is the, one of the nice things about this method is we're not relying on information from any of the other uh, radio, radiometry ch channels. And so just a quick few notation points for the mass that's coming up here. It doesn't matter about the wavelength we're using, so I'm going to drop the wavelength symb symbols. And in, in this process, I'm going to start using a subscript, uh, sorry, a superscript M to indicate the quantities that have been measured by the glider, and then a superscript I, which indicates like the number of the iteration that we're going around in this cycle. And so the first, first off, um, we want to, we're kind of working toward Gershon's law. So we want to have the upwelling irradiance and we have the upwelling radiance is what we measured. And so if we start with just an assumption that the light field is totally diffuse. So that means all the light is the same in every direction. Um, then we, that means um, the ratio between LU and EU is the value of pi. And we just kind of make this assumption for now. And as this process iterates on, this assumption kind of refines a bit more. And then we will estimate our absorption based on a simplified version of Gershon's law for now. And again, this will kind of be updated further on. And so, the idea here is the absorption is related to the cosine of the solar zenith angle um, of so where the sun is, but we want to know that below the water surface. And for the glider data, we know we have the time of day and the location of every measurement, so we can work out what the solar zenith angle is and put that into, into the equations. And uh, the other factor here is the diffuse attenuation coefficient for vector irradiance, which is just what this part is. So we needed our, this is measured and this is coming from this assumption up here. And so we can make a, a kind of crude estimate initially of our absorption profile. And then the next step is to estimate backscattering. And this equation kind of looks a bit scary to begin with. Um, and so here, though, if we look, um, this part is important. If we're just kind of going to blank this out for the time being, and does this part maybe looks a bit more familiar? So R is what we call the irradiance reflectance. Um, I, you might have covered that in some of your classes. It's, it's kind of similar to the remote sensing reflectance, which is maybe a bit more common, which is what you'll have done from a remote sensing point of view. But here, it's the ratio of the two irradiance values, the upwelling and the downwelling. And if we look at this bit in the box, we can kind of write it in a different way, which is R is proportional to 0 0.33 BB over A. And this, you might have seen in some of your earlier classes, but it's a kind of, it's a very common assumption that's made about the relationship between some of the, the AOPs and the radiometry with the backscattering and the absorption data. And it's true for homogeneous media, and it's true kind of in that surface layer, which is what's important here. And so when I say homogeneous media, I'm talking about a water column that's being fully mixed um, from the top to the bottom. But that isn't necessarily always what's happening realistically out there. Quite often we have stratified water bodies. So we get these differences in temperature or in density where you kind of have these kind of separations in the water column. And that can, um, that can affect what, how this light signal is extrapolated down in the water column. And so this um, can be replaced by a slightly different expression as shown by Howard Gordon in this kind of series of, of different papers. And if we just dig into this in a little bit more detail, it's kind of beginning to look a bit more complicated. This X is now our, our BB over A. So it's still like an R is proportional to BB over A divided by three. 
Um, but it's kind of this expectation value of that at the surface in this kind of weird integral equation. So this is something that's integrated over the euphotic zone. Um, and so from zero to the, where the irradiance is falling to 1% one per, one of its surface, 10% of its sur surface value. And if, when we're not going to go into the details really um, too much, but we assume that this, this relationship is valid at all depths. And so these all kind of get slightly updated. The surface values are being um, changed for, um, for depth values. And then we solve this equation for x. And we do some complicated maths where this gets put into here and we use this identity. And you end up with this expression, which is really just what is the rest of that equation. Yes. So have you done simulations to estimate the error associated with making that assumption of the quasi stable scattering approximation as a function of depth when really it's, it's applicable to the surface and not as a function of depth? Um, so are you talking about in terms of like using this x or using the the RRS equals the BB over A. Which gets propagated into X. Yeah. And so my understanding of this is like this form that, that we're using with this kind of, yes, it's still the BB over the A is still there within the X, but because of this other component that's being brought in in that integral here, um, and this is a function of your irradiance that um, that is removing some of those assumptions. I have not read all those papers in, in complete detail, fresh, or like recently, so I, I can't remember um, off the top of my head exactly how they did that and what analysis they did. And this is all to get just the initial guess. Yes. But it iterates. It does iterate. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It still uses, no, it kind of, it, we, it uses part of this. You'll see when we iterate <laughs> um, what it does. But you're right, it is to kind of get the initial guess and then, um, and we adjust this based on um, what that initial guess is and what the output was. And, there, and so actually in that Fanatile paper, they use a slightly different method to make their initial guesses of their IOPs. And they don't, they don't um, use this part. Okay, so we've made our absorption guess. We've made our backscattering guess. Do you think we have all the information that we need to do solve the radiative transfer equation? Exactly. <laughs> do you know what else you might need? Did you do some stuff with hydrolyte? I'm sure you guys did stuff with hydrolyte. Uh, no. So if you think about the hydrolyte, did you do a hydrolyte runs where you gave it just an absorption data and uh, attenuation data, right? And what else did you in those runs have to assume at some point or choose? Yeah, so I'm hearing backscattering or the, the phase function. So it, it kind of depends. The answer to this question is it kind of depends on what radiative transfer code you're using. So I used hydrolyte as well. And so um, I am giving it the absorb. We have the absorption information and the backscattering information. So we have to make an assumption about um, the phase function in which in hydrolyte can be driven by your backscattering ratio. And so we assume a backscattering ratio that's based on a kind of Gulf of Maine specific one. So with this time series that Barney's been running in the Gulf of Maine, we have a lot of scattering measurements and we have a lot of backscattering measurements. So we can make an assumption about what is a Gulf of Maine specific backscattering to scattering ratio. And from that, we select uh, the, the Fournier-Ferrand phase function that's kind of closest to that ratio is selected. 
So we have the absorption, the backscattering, and now we have a phase function that's um, part of that. And then we use those to solve the radiative transfer equation. And the parameters we are interested in getting out are the upwelling irradiance, the upwelling radiance, and the downwelling irradiance, and the downwelling scalar irradiance. And the scalar quantity, the one on the end, is important for when we are making our new guess at absorption because we're going to be using Gershon's law, which is where this part becomes important. And so we have these output values. We're going to compare them to the values that are on the glider in this kind of slightly complicated looking way, but we're really just looking at how different the two different the, two, the, the values are. And if this is below a specific threshold, we say, okay, our IOPs match. If it's not, we then go through this iteration where we're recalculating everything. And what we're going to do is we're going to recalculate first our um, irradiance reflectance. So update that based on our, um, our outputs from the hydrolyte run that we do. And then we update our Q. So at the start, we made a guess for Q that the, the light was diffuse. So we used this relationship of pi between the EU, EU and the LU. And that's quite a broad assumption that is quite often not true. And so what we can do now is kind of recalculate that based on the hydrolyte output and then use that value to update our, our measured EU. Because if you remember, we're not actually measuring EU, we're measuring LU, um, but we need to have a measured EU value for this inversion. And so now that those are updated, we are going to estimate our absorption again. So this, for comparison, is what we used for our first guess. And so for our second, we're using uh, this relationship of Gershon's law, which would be expand it out. Um, this is the mean cosine. And then this is how all these different quantities are, are kind of related. So we get a bit more, yes? Do you count No. So um, these were published in, this method was published in a series of four papers by Howard Garden. The first one deals with homogeneous. The second one deals, which is what this is, with um, vertically stratified. And one of the later ones accounts for Raman. Yeah, and um, we, um, so, I, so Howard is actually a co-author in this study and he felt like it was a part that we didn't necessarily need to do for the Gulf of Maine work because the Raman scattering shouldn't be as big a problem as um, some of the other components of this, which is why at the moment we're we stuck with this method. But it's something that's in the back of my mind is to kind of update, um, and I can't even remember now what the fourth update to the method was, um, but to kind of add those extra components in. And then the backscattering coefficient and um, is updated in a slightly different way. What we do is we look at the difference between the measured irradiance value and this one that's output from hydrolyte and then calculate a new x um, based on that, that difference and then calculate a new bb uh, based on that kind of difference in, or a difference in bb based on that difference on x based on that difference in the, the radian, irradiance reflectance and then add um, Multiply, by, uh, multiply that by a constant that um, then gets added to the backscattering of the previous iteration. And this constant is something that Howard did a lot of work on um, and it kind of is, defines, gives you a way to kind of define the speed of convergence of this method. And it has this value of 0.2. And I don't really know the exact details of where this came from. No, that's just a random, it's just a fraction, yeah, yeah. And so that's how we iterate around. So, so coming back to that discussion, those, those assumptions are still there, kind of buried within that. But you have hydrolyte runs. Yes. For which you could actually look at the ratio of how VMAC over A varies with R. 
high of what varies. Well, because you make an assumption that R is proportional to back over A, right? And that's not true once you get below the surface. Yep. But you, in doing that simulation, you actually could quantify what the relationship is in a maybe, maybe more of an empirical way, but you can see how, how wrong that relationship might be. And it just puts some uncertainty on this because you have all the data. Yeah. From the simulation, so you have what you need to do it. Yeah, that's true. It's a big approximation, but you can find out how big. Yeah, yeah. And it should be really huge. Yeah. No, that that's a very good point. And it's not something I've not looked at I've not looked at those numbers from the from the yeah, outputs I mean, that we have, you but have to like delta X. Yes. You have your guesses of feedback in A. Yeah. So you, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and so yeah, I can calculate that and compare that. Yeah, that's a good point. It's something that I can go back yeah. and look at. And yeah, there's been a lot of assumptions that have been made in this, but like, and, and you'll see once we get to the results um, that generally things actually work okay. Um, but it's interesting to think about if it's some of these, like which of these earlier assumptions that are being propagated the whole way through. And to be honest, I'm finding it kind of challenging to like follow those different parts through and figure out um, which of these assumptions that we're making are causing the inaccuracies that we're getting with some of the, the retrievals. But yeah, I never thought about comparing those particular components, which I can do. <laughs> yeah. When you're done though, the X, all you do if you improved X is improve your conversions. When you're done, you have a profile that gives you A and B, B that match L, U, and E, D. The X, if you made X better, all you do is maybe speed the conversions to get to that. Well, but I think that there's the assumption, because you're doing it over the entire water column, mm -hmm. that the X actually varies. Uh, in the final result, you, it doesn't matter. I don't know if I agree with that. So when, when you take your final A and B yeah. and put it in hydro, yeah. you can quantify the difference between the measured E and the model. Yeah. That yeah. would be a good thing. Yeah. You know, how well can you reconstruct your, your yeah. and that And that's what this is doing, yeah. right? No, so, yeah, in yeah. a sense. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll see, and we, we do do that. And so you'll, you'll see with the backscattering changing, backscattering change. Um, but I didn't, I didn't try changing like any of the assumptions about we are making to initially estimate our absorption or our backscattering. Um, but I don't know, I kind of agree with Ken. Like it doesn't really matter at some point what those assumptions are when you're making them because in the end, you're getting to a profile, a set of IOPs that produce a radiometry field that matches the radiometry field that was measured in situ. So, like some of the assumptions that went into that. Except there's a lot of transference and variance between when you have a ratio of something over something else, and you could be overestimating A and underestimating B because you're making the assumption about the ratio between So that's, that's the only part, and that's in fact what they found. But in the end, you're not using it. Yes. Because hydro light assumes with the sky. Yes. The clear sky model yeah. or something. And we did, again, I don't know how we did that. It could not affect a lot if you're looking at ratios. Yep. Good. Absolute radiance and absolute radiance. That would be as significant. Yep. Um, and so we do. Um, vary the, the solar zenith angle, and you'll see that for some of the modeling studies that we do to test this. Um, that, that's easy. Yeah. That's yeah. Input, but I'm talking about the partial calculus we see almost every day. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. And I can't remember, I, did, I can't remember now off the top of my head, it, what, it's not included here if I did those runs. I did play around with a lot of those different, um, different parameters, though. Um, and I, when I was looking at the results, I was typically looking though at the absorption and the backscattering recovery. I don't know if I, I definitely did at some point, but again, it, it kind of got dropped and I didn't continue and I can go back and look at that. But I didn't directly compare 
necessarily always the full profiles of the ED and the LU that are coming out with what was measured. I was comparing the, the backscattering and the, the absorption for the modeling rather than that kind of intermediate step. But there's, like, I have all these data, I've done all these hydrolyte runs, and so I can go back and kind of play around with some of 